Good evening, and welcome to Direct Impact Broadcasting, the station of growth and transformation. Affiliate of Creative Broadcasting presents Leadership Tidbits with Coach T. Wilson, with your host, Taiwana Wilson, as she welcomes her guest to the studio. Welcome to Leadership Tidbits with Coach T. Wilson. I am your host, Tywana Wilson. A little bit about myself. I am your award-winning leadership maven, medical laboratory scientist by background, best-selling author, owner and chief leadership coach at Trendy Elite Coaching and Consulting Services, executive director with the John Maxwell team, Maxwell Disc Certified Consultant, Send Out Cards Referral Partner, and co-owner of Direct Impact Broadcasting Radio Station. Before we bring on my special guest, I want to share a few announcements. I am booking guests for this podcast through the remainder of 2019. You can go on to www.podcast.coachtwilson.com to submit your interest. All of my leadership and strength assessments are now on sale at www.trendyelitellc.com. And thank you to my media mentors, Ms. Ashley Little and Ms. Kimberly McLemore of Talk Radio and TV Network, LLP. Today's special guest, Ms. Deasa Nichols. Deasa Nichols has 30 years of executive experience within healthcare, government, financial services, and the automotive industry. Deasa currently serves as manager of supplier diversity for Cincinnati Children's Hospital. In this role, she is responsible for leading Cincinnati Children's multi-million dollar supplier diversity strategy with minority and women-owned business enterprises. Cincinnati Children's is leading the way in transforming our regional economy with its $600 million critical care building. The project is amongst the groundbreaking projects, including Location T Building and the Liberty Project, for which supplier diversity goals were set and exceeded. Her MWBE experience has been featured in Black Enterprise and Diversity Incorporated magazines. She is a former president of the Greater Cincinnati African American Chamber of Commerce, where she led the nearly 900 plus membership organization from 2001 to 2005. Deasa is the recipient of many honors, including receiving an invitation to the White House by the President of the United States, named a Minority Business Advocate by the South Central Ohio Minority Business Council, and the Regional Chamber's Minority Business Accelerator Applause Magazine Emerging Leader and Image Maker Honoree, and named a 40 Under 40 Business Leader by the Cincinnati Business Courier. In 2011, Deasa co-founded the Young Girls Gathering, a mentoring and character-building organization committed to empowering girls ages 10 to 18. She currently serves on the board of directors for the YWCA of Greater Cincinnati, vice chair of governance committee, Mamie Earl Sales Scholarship Committee, Father's Day Fundraising Committee Chair, the Urban Minority Alcohol and Drug Abuse Outreach Program, where she is chair of of the board, Cincinnati Public Schools Girls with Pearls Mentor, and Cincinnati Red Community Fund Youth Baseball Mentor. Former board service includes Huntington National Bank, United Way of Greater Cincinnati, 3CDC, Cincinnati Mayor's Economic Inclusion Advisory Council, and the Ohio Governor's Committee on Minority Business Development. Deasa has a BS, uh, BA, and an MBA degree from Zagre University. She is an active member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated and a mentor to women and girls around the world. As such, she loves to travel having returned from South America in an Antarctica earlier this year. Achieving a travel bucket list goal to vacation on all seven continents. In her spare time, Deasa enjoys spending time with family and friends, going to the theaters, concerts, reading, sporting events, shopping, and yes, traveling. Good evening, good evening. Deasa, how are you doing this evening? 
I am awesome. That was a long list. I don't know who that lady is you was talking about. I don't know who, who that is. I am just the Asa. I am wonderful. It has been a beautiful today, day today. There were some historic things that have taken place in our city, specifically the ordinance that was passed around natural hair. And if anybody knows me, I've been rocking that for a very long time. So I'm, I'm just, I'm fired up. I'm, I'm, I'm ready. How are you? I'm doing awesome. I am so excited to finally get you on here and hear all the wonderful things that you're doing and, and things that's happening uh, around the city that you're involved with. So let's jump right in. Can, right. You sh- can you share with the listening audience a little bit about your leadership journey and how did you get to where you are today? Oh, first of all, to I want to thank you very much for allowing me to be a part of the program. I really do appreciate it. I think we had this conversation back in July, and here it is, October, and um, I'm here to share some leadership tidbits. And to God be the glory for um, even just having the opportunity. So my leadership journey, it really started out of my mom being a single working mother. Mm-hmm. I am the oldest um, sibling of a total of three, all girls, and I was responsible Mm -hmm. for making sure that me and my sister got to and from school um, because my mother was working. So at the time, uh, we were latchkey kids. So um, I would make sure we would get home safely get in the house, do our homework, do our chores. So my first real leadership began, I'll say, in leading my sister. Secondly, my journey into leadership was through church. My first board role, believe it or not, was on the junior usher board at church. That is, in fact, the real board. It required attending meetings, providing input, you know, executing um, uh, programs, Um, you know, you had to work as a team with not only the other members of the junior usher board, but also those that were part of the adult um, usher board. So it's also my journey into leading others, followed by going Mm -hmm. um, into high school and to college. I held various leadership positions. Um, Mm -hmm. I was class president for a couple of years throughout junior high school and high school. Um, I was a math tutor. Uh, I was a part of a high school kind of sorority, if you will. So, again, leadership has really just been a natural part of who I am. I think it's because I like accomplishing goals, Tawana. Or another way to really put it is hashtag GST. I like to get stuff done. And so (laughs) in getting stuff done, sometimes you have to be the person to lead that effort. But then fast forward to when I was in college, I had some really, really great internships with um, companies like uh, Fifth Third Bank. A lot of people don't know that. Uh, worked for Cincinnati Bell as an intern in IBM. But it was when I had my first sort of real job, and I worked for a black-owned business. It was owned by an African-American female, and it was a company called Applause Magazine. And that really was the catalyst for my entry into the world of supplier diversity, working with minority and women-owned businesses, and that's what ultimately led me on my leadership journey. Because when I was at Applause Magazine, by it being a very small company, I was responsible for things that I would have never been able to be responsible for in a large organization. I'm 22, 23 years old, something like that, and I'm responsible for sponsorships, subscription sales, marketing, 
working with our advertising agency that was local, also interfacing with advertising agencies that were in New York, Chicago, Atlanta, um, hiring freelance writers and photographers and other service providers. So doing all these aspects of business operations, I was able to, a, um, um, able to gain a lot of business skills that I would have never gotten. And after coming out of that experience, I really felt as though I could I could lead anything. Because so first and foremost, I was leading myself. <laughs> That's where I started. I was leading myself. And this woman, um, her name was Sally Elliott, the mm-hmm. owner of the magazine, she had given me the opportunity to demonstrate my leadership skills inside of the company that she was yet still birthing. I mean, because it was still a very, a fairly new company. So that's kind of how my leadership journey started. And just one quick example about what I was able to do in that role. We it was a magazine, and the magazine also put on an event called the Applause Image Maker Awards, which was also it was televised. It was. It was an event that was produced and televised. And being in charge of helping to sell sponsorship, we were scheduled to go, the owner and I were scheduled to go to meet with a bank to acquire a large sponsorship. Well, on the day of the meeting, she was sick. And I'm like, okay, I know we're going to have to reschedule this. And you know, this is what I'm thinking. She said, no, you need to go ahead and go meet with the bank president again. I'm early 20s. I'm like, this could not, can't be happening to me. I go meet with the bank president. We're having a conversation. It seems to be going well. And I think I was supposed to ask for maybe, I think it was $15,000, somewhere around in there, I believe. All I remember is that the conversation was going so well. And when it got to the ask in terms of what we were, what, what we asked in the bank for, $25,000 just fell off my tongue. And lo and behold, we ended up getting this sponsorship for $25,000. And the rest was history with me. And this, this working at this company, she just, she just allowed me to just blossom and flourish. Wow. That's amazing. That is very awesome. So you started your leadership very early, getting involved, getting involved with with church and and the community really kind of became your foundation for who you are today. Pretty much so. Um, And, again, as a result of that, I was led to other, ultimately had other, you know, with big roles with titles, um, president of the African-American Chamber of Commerce, supplier diversity professional within the automotive industry. I worked at Toyota for a short period of time, um, ADP, which is a global management service provider um, in New York. So it, all this, it was really by just raising my hand, stepping up, and, you know, when you see an opportunity to fill a gap and no one else is stepping up or hesitant to step up, when you raise your hand and you step up, even if you fall short, I think most people can respect the fact that at least this person stepped up. What else will they step up for or what else can we give them that they might be able to have uh, some success in? So it's just natural for me to see a challenge, see an issue, question it, and then if I can fill the gap, offer my skills and my ability to see how I might be able to advance the situation or solve the problem. Absolutely. I love that you say that, that, you know, people are willing to give you a chance if and only if you step up and you show that you have that interest, you show that you have that initiative, you never know who may have the key to open up your door. So I think that's important for our young people and those that's looking to uh, get into advanced roles to know that they need to step up too because you never know who may have that opportunity that you need. Absolutely. Go ahead. No, I was just saying absolutely. And 
I think that some people are waiting to be tapped or they're waiting to be asked. That's a, a reactive process. Take a proactive process and say, hey, I'm looking to uh, sharpen my skills in a particular area or at this point in my career I thought I would have been doing certain type of work or having certain type of projects. I'm ready to take on some new challenges, some new opportunities, or learn some new skills or get integrated differently into this division, department, or organization. How, how about a certain project get assigned to me so that a person can see that you're willing to, um, you're willing to offer some different skills that you may not be offering in your current role? Absolutely. So leaders come from all walks of life. We all have different skills, different strengths. Uh, what skills and strengths do you possess that you think have been the most important on your leadership journey thus far? I would have to say my number one strength is focus, and let me tell you why. I was a single mother very early. I had my daughter right after high school. And when you are a parent at the age of 19, you have to be focused. All of the goals and dreams and aspirations that I wanted to do, like go to college, you know, all those things were still going to take place for me, but it was going to require focus. And once I made the decision that, okay, I have this new person in my life, my daughter, um, I'm going to have to make some adjustments but I'm still not going to lose sight of what I want to do in life. And as a result, I went through college while being a mother and just never missed a beat. Had lots of help, and I'm thankful and grateful for the help of my parents, my mother specifically. There was a woman by the name of Ms. Johnson. She was uh, uh, the babysitter for my daughter. I never had a babysitter issue or a babysitter concern. So I had a lot of help, but at the same time, I was very focused. And I think the people that were in my life to help me, they saw that I was focused, and so they became invested and invested in my success. So my focus, number one. Number two, my ability to hear and to listen. Both are critical. And then be able to communicate and communicate well. I'm very organized and orderly. I'm performance and results driven. Resourcefulness is a part of my strength. Tawana, also the ability I'm trustworthy. And what I mean by that is this, gaining confidence, the confidence of other people by demonstrating my reliability. If I raise my hand for something, it shall be completed. It shall be completed. I'm going to finish what I start no matter what. Everybody doesn't always get to that level um, because of life circumstances. And then also, too, very resilient. I'm, I, I, I have my bounce back game is good. <laughs> it's like if you fall down, <laughs> you just have to get back up. <laughs> you're right. As leaders, we fall down a lot. <laughs> and, and you're right. You have to be able to, to get back up because leadership is hard, and it, it can be very tough uh, at times, especially if you are, are newer in the role and, and trying to manage today in such a multi-generational uh, workplace. And I don't know any leader that hasn't failed, any leader that hasn't have, had a misstep, any leader that hasn't reflected and said, oh, did the wrong thing that time. I thought it was the right thing at the time, but that really was the wrong thing. And how do I correct my steps, you know, and do better the next time? But, you know, you can't get stuck there. One of the things that I say, um, too, is that, you know, um, shame is a waste of time. I think I'm really hard to be shamed. <laughs> Probably should be ashamed of certain things, but 
it's, shame is a waste of time. It's like admit what you did. You made a mistake. You got it wrong. You, you it, it did turn out the way that you you wanted to, wanted it to. Evaluate it, course correct, and get back up and keep it moving. Absolutely. And so it's it's interesting that you started talking about failure because, you know, as leaders, as people in the management roles, you know, as people that mentor people, there's always success, there's always failure. So uh, what has what has success taught you during your journey? I would say success number one has taught me humility. Um, success has also taught me that um, it's a shared, that you share it. It's not yours and yours alone. Many people, as I mentioned, have been right there for me and have been helping me along my journey to be successful. Um, also, too, those same people have also been there when I've fallen short. And that's why you have to surround yourself surround yourself with people that you value and that they value you and they really want to see you succeed. Because on the other hand, too, not everyone is going to embrace your success. And that can be t- that can be difficult because it's like, you know, why wouldn't everybody why wouldn't people be happy for uh, other people's success? Because my internal compass is that. I'm happy when people succeed. I'm excited. As a matter of fact, I'm much better at promoting and celebrating other people's success than I am my own. That's a really, really difficult thing for me to do, very, very difficult. But success, you know, it can it can make a positive impact or it can have a negative impact in some cases. Success can make you a positive target. It can make you a negative uh, target. So... Everybody wants success or they think they want success, but there are a lot of things that come along with it. We've heard uh, the uh, statement sometimes, new levels, new devils. Uh, That is true. Um, I did want to talk about some of the mistakes, though, that I have made along the way um, on this journey um, to success. There's a book that's out that's called The 48 um, Laws of Power. Um, You're probably familiar with it. Probably those that are listening are probably familiar with it. And the number one law is never outshine the master. That's the Mm. number one law. Well, I wish somebody would have told me that early on because When you're sometimes just feeling like you're doing a good job, you're told to, you know, run this project, um, uh, um, uh, do this set of tasks, and you do it, and you do it well, you do it efficiently, you do it effectively, Um, it could have two different effects. Um, Sometimes that might make people that you report to or those around you uh, feel uncomfortable. It might inspire fear and insecurity. So you, I had to learn very early not to outshine the master or not to um, just to balance, balance that uh, because it caused me uh, to make some missteps in my career. There's also a law that talks about um, knowing who you're dealing with so that you don't sort of offend the wrong people. Boy, did I do that on a couple of occasions. Not through, not because I was trying to do that, but sometimes you may say the right thing at the wrong time or in the wrong way, and it can be it can be offensive to someone, and sometimes people hold on to those offenses, and then they'll also hold those offenses against you. And then the other law that I was a violator of, if you will, that caused me some missteps and some failure was um, never 
appear to be too perfect. Now, the interesting thing about that, nowhere near perfect. Nowhere near perfect. (laughs) But it's other people's perception where they think that you are perfect. And I'm sure people have heard the thing, her, he thinks he's all of that, or she thinks she's all of that. And that's really somebody else's view of you, but sometimes that's they're making you to be perfect or something that you're not. And that can be very, very dangerous because it can create um, silent enemies, <laughs> and that can be very, very harmful to a person both professionally and personally, and I have had um, to walk through that through the course of my journey. So, But I'm not perfect, nowhere near close. I'm all flawed up. Only Beyonce woke up like that. I didn't. (laughs) (laughs) That's good that you say that because it is interesting that, you know, other people's perception uh, of of you, especially in not wanting to appear appear to be uh, too perfect, other people thinking uh, you are, especially if you're are doing good things uh, or are successful in your own right, you know, people may have that perception, oh, she, she thinks she's perfect. When On the inside, you probably don't feel that way at all. So that's – Absolutely uh, not. <laughs> <laughs> so that's great information uh, that you shared with us. You are currently the manager of supplier diversity at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center, one of the top pediatric hospitals in the country. How fortunate are we in the city of Cincinnati to have uh, Cincinnati Children's uh, here in our community? But can you tell the listeners a little more about your role and the importance of what you do uh, in our community and with our local businesses? Absolutely, and this is so timely because we recently um, had a press conference at the Cincinnati Children's in regards to some of the work that we're doing in supplier diversity. So um, as a supplier diversity manager um, for Cincinnati Children's, my job is to accomplish four objectives. Number one is to identify minority and women-owned businesses for contracting opportunities with Cincinnati Children. Number two is to ensure that those suppliers are included in our bid opportunities for contracting opportunities at Cincinnati Children. Number three, work to make sure that those suppliers are actually awarded business by Cincinnati Children, where they actually become suppliers and a part of our supply chain. And then number four, report the results internally and to our external partners throughout the community. So identify suppliers, include those suppliers, help those suppliers get awarded, competitively awarded um, contracts, and then report those numbers to our community. So Many people might know, and I think you read this in the opening, Cincinnati Children's is building a $600 million critical care building that's scheduled to open in late uh, 2021. And, of course, we want minority suppliers to be a part of that process, and they are. So we've set supplier diversity goals for both minority and women-owned businesses to be a part of this from a, in the construction of it. So our supplier diversity goal um, is 30, it's a 30% goal, and that's for uh, minority and women-owned suppliers. That 30% equates to $91 million. Uh, currently, we're at 32%, so we're already over our goal and trending up um, for a total of million. So think about those numbers and how those numbers are going to be able to impact minority and women owned businesses Mm -hmm. in our our, um, uh, supply chain who have minority and women owned employees 
working at those companies who are also a part of the community. This is so massive, and to be a part of this and helping to lead this effort, Cincinnati Children as an institution, our goal is to change the outcome for our patients and our families that come to Cincinnati Children from all over the world where supplier diversity, we're changing outcomes as well. And to be a part of this, it's, 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 it's so fulfilling and rewarding for me because we work with many local businesses at the micro level. So we're working with businesses that are startups. They come to us through Mortar, which is um, uh, in OTR, as well as they uh, work throughout several communities uh, in Cincinnati, Wanna Hill, Avondale. Uh, but we'll, we get businesses in our supply chain from Mortar. We also have a partnership with the Regional Chamber of Commerce and the Minority Business Accelerator uh, Program. Um, who work with uh, minority women-owned companies who are at least at a million dollars in revenue and higher. So we're working with uh, what I'd like to call, you know, the, uh, the, the undergraduates all the way up to the graduate uh, business that are a part of our community. So it's a very rewarding work to be a part of. Awesome. Wow. You all are doing a lot in the community. I mean, we, we, we have to. We're, we're right in the heart of, heart of the community. We're a leading pediatric institution. As I mentioned, patients come to Cincinnati Children from all over the country. Um, I was out at a restaurant uh, a couple of months ago and struck up a conversation with a lady, and come to find out she actually – moved here from um, Europe because she had a, her daughter has um, some special um, uh, health concern and she needed to be in sense and she needed to be here for the sake of her daughter. And those stories come all the time. I mean, whenever I'm traveling, if so happens, Children's Hospital comes up because sometimes I uh, have this backpack. It's a logo backpack, and it says Cincinnati Children's on it. A conversation will, will, will come about, and you hear people talking about their experiences with Cincinnati Children's. And so not only, again, is that on our patient and family side, but hopefully as we go forward, you'll hear business owners and employees and families within our community talking about the great work that Cincinnati Children's has done and how it has impacted their lives. Absolutely. Children's is doing a lot uh, in the community. Uh, I've actually did part of my career at Cincinnati uh, Children's, and, and it was definitely one of the highlights uh, of my career of being uh, within that organization. So. Uh, most of the people that work there are very proud, and if you've worked there before, um, you are, have, are proud uh, to have been part of that community. So that is awesome what you all are doing. Yes, it's, you, it's, it's, it's great work. You co-founded Young Girls Gathering, a mentoring and character-building organization committed to empowering girls ages 10 to 18 and serve on numerous boards that support youth empowerment. Why is mentoring and programs like these so important to the development of today's youth? Um, first off, um, as you mentioned, I am a co-founder, so which means there are other people involved. So the Young Girls Gathering was started with uh, my mother, um, Jessie Drake, um, her neighbor, Miss um, Janie Allen, I think is her last name, um, and my sister, my daughter, and a couple other people from my mother's neighborhood. And we, we just saw the need, again, going back to proactively identifying and seeing a need and stepping in and filling the gap. But mentoring is important to me because I believe that a measure of a person's life is the impact that they have on others. And mentoring is a great way to impact other people while giving back. Uh, and you and I both know this because we're both part of um, sororities, um, 
Alpha Alpha Incorporated, myself, and you're a part of Delta Sigma Theta. And in our sororities, we pledge to be of service, especially to girls and women. And so I have uh, an affinity for that, and I think part of that comes from I'm a I'm sister, uh, I have, have sisters, um, I have a daughter, um, a granddaughter, uh, and friends. And people poured into me, and it's only right for me to give back and pour into others. And the thing that mentoring does, it, it, it exposes individuals. It gives individuals the opportunity for exposure. If you see something, you can you can see certain things, and then you can dream about certain things. But when you're exposed to them, that's an even stronger motivator. Most recently, uh, Tyler Perry he opened his studio in Atlanta, and on an interview, I heard him say that where this vision came from. He said he attended uh, Oprah Winfrey's now legendary. Uh, uh, Legends Ball, and he said he just he was he was in amazement and in awe to see what was taking place, and he challenged himself. He said to big a dream uh, to big uh, to dream a bigger dream and to aim higher. And it was at that point that he began thinking about a bigger dream, and that bigger dream came true um, just here uh, last week. So exposure. And as a mentor, you also have the opportunity to share wisdom with other, with, with young people, um, and the opportunity to just counsel them based upon your own personal life experiences and what uh, you have learned along the way. And now you can impart that to somebody else that can help make a difference in their life. And giving is one of the greatest gifts. Um, to be able to give is one of the greatest gifts I think that God has blessed me with because I am a natural giver. And to share my wisdom and share, you know, things that I went through, if that's going to help somebody along their journey, again, I raise my hand for that. And also, uh, being a mentor, it helps you to provide guidance. And Tawana, from time to time, we all need guidance. And so to be able to offer this to these young girls, it's it was it's it's just it's just awesome and uh it's very, very fulfilling. And then when we talk about uh the character traits that come along with that, teaching them things like being honest, being respectful, having respect for themselves and others, taking responsibility, being courageous, having self discipline and being trustworthy. Absolutely, absolutely. And you're right. It's it's very important uh, for us to give and and mentor and nurture and coach uh, our young people. I just had a daughter who's seven weeks old, and I hope along myself, along with uh, my tribe, uh, will let her know that those things that, you know, she's beautiful, she's important, she's special, you know, she's smart, all of those things. So I apply you for what you do because that 10 to 18 year age is very important. It's a critical time in our young people's lives. So thank you for uh, what you do, not just with that organization, but the many organizations that you serve. And as I said, I did want to mention some of those organizations. So I think, again, you mentioned this a little bit in my bio. So I'm on the board for the YWCA. Oh, man, you're talking about a, a great placement. I'm, I'm vested invest, and invested. I'm committed, lifting as we climb, making sure that we are being inclusive. Um, as a board member, I also am um, the vice chair of the governance committee along with uh, dear friend of mine, uh, Arlene Koff, who might be on the call. Um, she's a great person to serve alongside, as well as all of uh, the, the, the board members, but also keep, uh, um, Chair 
our Mamie Earl Sell Scholarship um, Committee, which um, the Mamie Earl Scholarship is for graduating high school um, young women uh, who have a need um, to help them advance to the next level of their education. So it's very fulfilling and very rewarding. Um, and most recently, too, I just became a uh, board member for the Reds Community Fund, which is part of Major League Baseball. I'm just over the moon about being able to impact young girls and young boys, for that matter, who are interested in um, going, interested in baseball, just general, in general, interested in baseball, interested in softball. Uh, I am a firm believer in team sports because I believe that that builds character. I participated in team sports throughout my life, and uh, it, it just helps give you that balance to know that the world is not all about you. It doesn't revolve around you, and you cannot get anything done in this world without a team or as you say, without a tribe, and being um, the mother of a daughter. When people talk about role models, one of the things I actually prophesied over my daughter's life when she was very little, I said, guess what? She can have as many role models as she desires, but her mother will be in the number. I love that. That is awesome. That is awesome. I love it. In a time where we are asked to be our best in our careers, be great role models, great parents, it is very easy to get stretched too thin. What strategies would you give to our listeners who are struggling to maintain that, that work-life balance, that work-life harmony? Uh, what, what would you tell people? Because that's something that it seems like mom and, and career women and really leaders kind of have a challenge with. Well, I tell you this, I have the I have the gift of no. It wasn't uh, always that way. Again, when you're raising your hand, sometimes you can raise your hand to the point where you're out of balance, uh, and uh, you find yourself you know, having. You know, 14-hour days, 15-hour days, and I love my sleep, so I don't want to have crazy days like that. So um, <laughs> I think one of the things that we have to, we have to be true to ourselves. We have to know what's our capacity. What's our capacity? And the ability to say no and give yourself to yourself before you give yourself away is a must. I tell myself and other people, you have to learn to be kind to yourself. And if you find yourself where you are feeling overwhelmed or that you have a lot on your plate, ask for help. Someone asked me a couple of years ago, they said, Diego, do you have a problem asking for help? Absolutely not. I sure <laughs> don't. <laughs> no, because i rather ask for help than to try to do things and not be able to do them effectively. When I was in undergraduate school, one of my uh, professors said something to me that I never forgot. He said, it's better to do a little well than a lot haphazardly. It's better to do a little well than a lot haphazardly. And that has remained with me for years. So... I ask for help, I say no, and also, too, a lot of, I get invited to a lot of things. So for every one thing that I say yes to, I say no to two or three other things. I don't have the fear of missing out. I don't have the fear of missing out. You go to the party, you serve on the committee, you take on 19 projects, have at it, do your best. Do you think, girl? Do you think, son? Do you think, boy? <laughs> do it. I'm going to manage what I'm capable of managing because I'd rather do it and do it well than to not deliver. Those that know me, I am a fan of skills. I am a fan of results. If you have skills that can get result, results, I am so impressed. Otherwise, I'm kind of hard to impress. <laughs> so, oh, and if you're a truthful person. So if you tell the truth, you have skills, and you can get results, 
that's like a winning combination for me. So, um, but you just you just have to be able to know how much you can take on um, in your personal life, how much you can take on in your professional life, how much you can take on in your community life, and set your own level and deliver and deliver well. And when you're telling people no, you don't have to give an explanation. And my practice with no came with my daughter, my mother, and my granddaughter. And if I can say no to them three, mm-hmm. I can say no to anybody. <laughs> I love that. Have the gift of no and you don't have to give an explanation when doing so because sometimes when you are involved in the community, it, it's easy to say, yes, I'll do it uh, and overextend yourself. So I love that, being able to say no and, and don't feel anything about it. Yep, on to the next. <laughs> <laughs> so, D.A., so many people struggle with thinking outside of the box and finding ways to reinvent themselves outside of their chosen profession. What advice would you give to our listener audience on strategies for thinking outside of the box, getting out of that comfort zone, and finding those opportunities? That's a really, really good question Um, because I think some people think that, you know, they're designed to do one thing or a thing, and that's the thing that they stick with. What I would challenge people to do, and I've challenged myself to do this many times throughout my life, is go somewhere and lock yourself in somewhere. It can be a lock-in at your own home. It can be a lock-in at a hotel, a retreat somewhere. But go somewhere and do your own self-analysis. And write down what you're currently doing, and then write down things that, you, that you're also currently doing, but maybe you're not getting paid for them, um, or you're not making as much time time to do those things. And then write down those things that you, you know, you just kind of fantasize about. And look at what you have down on paper. And pick one or two things that's outside of what you're currently doing and go do it. Go try it. Just just try it out um, and see where it leads. There are many people that I know a lot of people who have gone to law school, lots of people that have gone to law school, went to law school, even passed the bar, and started out as an attorney. And they're doing mm-hmm. something totally different, totally different. And one person that actually comes to mind that we all know is Michelle Obama. Michelle Obama went to law school, started working in a law firm, And one day while she was at work, she just said, I don't want to do this anymore. She revealed that in her book, Becoming, which I read. (laughs) And (laughs) she just just went to do something differently. And she found herself working in city government um, for the city of Chicago. Um, She was in health care for a little while, and now the rest is history. So... I believe that we were all given we were all given multiple talents, multiple skills, and multiple um, gifts that we can do. Sometimes we do those things in a linear fashion. Sometimes we do them all at once. But we have to tap into, you know, what what's our purpose? Our purpose is in life, and not be afraid to do something differently. So the joke with me and my friends, and it's really not a joke, is that I love graders. Um, I love everything about graders, the ice cream, the, the donuts, the cheese crowns, everything about graders. And my second act, I might be working at graders, and I'm going to be just as happy as I am now <laughs> because <laughs> I'm in a happy place. And sometimes, I mean, you know, really, sometimes people, they don't want to. They don't want to make a shift because of how they think other people will think about it. But if it's going to create a place of fulfillment and happiness for you, again, no, you're not living your life for what other people think. You're living your life for yourself. Absolutely. 
So as our time tonight is coming to a close, what tidbit or two of wisdom did you want to leave our listeners with that they could carry on and, and implement tomorrow? Because here we believe in giving you practical strategies that you can implement right away. I know probably many people have said this, I'm sure, because it's not, it's not new. It's, it's, it's out there in the universe. Uh, but when you go to work tomorrow, if there's something that you have been leaving behind, take it with you. Be your true and authentic self. Again, I talked about earlier here in Cincinnati today, an ordinance was passed around uh, natural hair, people not being discriminated uh, for their natural hair. Be who you are. When you step into being who you are, it will be. Um, it will sometimes surprise you how embracing that will be. Um, I think I've just been my authentic self since I was very little. I, I just thank God for parents and grandparents, aunts and uncles who poured into me uh, to have solid self-esteem. I know who I am and whose I am, and I am very comfortable in my own skin, no matter what boardroom I'm in, no matter what bathroom I'm in, no matter what room I'm in. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I'm still myself, and I'm comfortable with who I am. So if you were leaving any part of you, if you left any part of you behind today, I challenge the listeners to bring all of who they are to their environment tomorrow. So that's one practical step that they can that they can take. Also I encourage people to read. Read books. Read articles. Find something that you can read. Tonight. If you come to my home, every room in my home has multiple books. Every room. Because when you read, you're making an investment in yourself, and as you are investing in yourself, you're likely to be able to make a greater investment in those around you. Awesome. So how can the listeners stay connected with you? The listeners can stay connected with me um, by emailing me. Uh, my email address is d e a s a u s a at gmail dot com. I'm also on LinkedIn, although I need to step up my social media game because remember I said I'm not really good at promoting myself. I'm better at promoting others. So, but I am on LinkedIn. You know, trying to do better around that. So that's an area of opportunity for me. So if there's anybody listening that can help me with my social media, give me, send me an email. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, yeah. And then um, my uh, office number at Cincinnati Children's, it's 513-803-5384. Uh, there might be some diverse suppliers out there that have goods and services that Cincinnati Children can benefit from, so we're certainly always looking to make sure that we have qualified and quality uh, diverse suppliers within our supply chain. Um, just real quick, too, I just wanted to go back to talking about, you know, um, how I'm an avid book reader. I'd like to recommend a couple of books for some folks. Um, one is The Four Agreements. It's kind of been out for a very long time, but it's by Don uh, Miguel. Um, in The Four Agreements, it talks about be impeccable with your word. Don't take things personally. Don't make assumptions and always do your best. Um, I'm also, like I said, on the board, uh, several boards. I just recently got introduced uh, to a book called The Imperfect Board Member. Really, really good for somebody that's just getting onto a board or those that have been on board for a very long time. It's kind of told in a, in a parable um, because board dynamics are different for different organizations. Um, also, there's a book um, that I was turned on to a long time ago that I'm just going to say it's called Emotional BS. Um, really, really good book because um, it talks about all the ways that um, some of the 
BS things that we deal with in our personal and professional lives, it threatens and destroys true and authentic relationships. And um, this book kind of tells you how to move away from that so we can just stop it and just stop the BS and so that we can really create um, true and authentic uh, relationships and collaborations so that we can all get to our next and all get to our greatest. Awesome. Those are some really great resources. Of course, I could talk to you uh, for another hour, but unfortunately our time tonight has come to a close. But I wanted to thank you for just taking the time out of your busy schedule for saying yes and giving me the opportunity to interview you tonight. D.A. said it was definitely an honor and a pleasure to have you on as my guest. So many blessings and much continued success to you and your journey, on your journey. Many blessings to you too as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. So thank you, listening audience, for tuning in to tonight's show with my special guest, Deasa Nichols, where she shared with us, don't have the fear of missing out. Don't feel like you have to do everything that comes your way. Have the gift to say no. And you don't have to explain yourself when you do say no. It is important to be of service and to give back. When you think about who you are, focus is critical. Focus and being resourceful, the ability to be able to hear and listen. So don't uh, listen to respond, really listen. Being trustworthy and being a person of your word. Make sure you are kind to yourself as you go along your leadership journey. Make sure that you're, you're kind to yourself. Make sure that you ask for help. Be a fan of results. So make sure that you are out here not just talking about it, but getting results. It's better to do a a little well than a lot haphazardly. Also, a few books you can put on your list, The Four Agreements, The Imperfect Board Member, and Emotional BS. Be true and authentic to yourself. Make sure you read books and articles because it's important to invest in yourself. And you can use the hashtag GSD, getting stuff done. If you like what you heard tonight and want to listen to Mm -hmm. previous shows, subscribe at www.podcast.coachtwilson.com. And if you're thinking about starting your own podcast or radio show, I would love to help you out. Just send me an email at dibroadcasting at trendyelite, L-L-C, that's T-R-E-N-D-Y-E-L-I-T-E, L-L-C.com. And please tune in next week to hear from another amazing leader. Until then, have a good evening. Thank you, friends, for tuning in to another episode of Leadership Tidbits with Coach T. Wilson, where Taiwana speaks with leaders who share nuggets of wisdom that you can use in your personal and professional life. Follow her on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Coach T. Wilson. Connect on LinkedIn or visit www.coachtwilson.com. And remember, in life, learn as much as you can, appreciate often, and lead fearlessly.